Um, thanks, Sarah. And um, this is kind of an outline of our talk today. I'm going to talk a little bit about some general principles of reader's advisory, and then more in depth about some appeal characteristics and how you can use those in your work with your patrons to help match them with the kind of books they like to read. Um, some of you might be wondering how much reader's advisory we do at the University of Wyoming, and we do do some. Although a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today is material that I learned when I was in library school. I was lucky enough to study reader's advisory with Nancy Pearl when I was in library school in Seattle. And so a lot of the material here is not mine. It's material that I learned from Nancy Pearl and have used throughout my professional career and also watched other librarians use. I came up working at Seattle Public Library and that library system has a really big culture of reader's advisory and it was something that we were all absolutely expected to do and participate in as part of our jobs. Um, so it was an exciting time to be there and an exciting way to approach um, the philosophy of reader's advisory basically. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I will say that um, reader's advisory is something that I think a lot of us can get scared of sometimes. Um, but what we need to remember is just a few guiding principles. Things that we need to keep in mind when we're working with our patrons. And I think that these guiding principles can really make a difference in terms of how we see our work with our patrons and how we see reading in general. The first of these guiding principles is to believe that pleasure reading is worthwhile. I think that in order to be an effective reader's advisor, you need to really believe that what you're talking about is a worthwhile pursuit and that reading for pleasure is a great use of your time and a great conversation to have with your library patrons. Along those lines, um, I think it's important to remember that there's no such thing as a good book. And I guess I would put good in quotes. Um, so remember that your patrons aren't thinking in those terms and there's no reason for us to feel like some books are more important than others or more good than others. All in all, we just want people to be reading. We want to talk to patrons about books. We want to enjoy the printed word or the electronically printed word. Um, so keeping an open mind with reader's advisory is a really important skill, I think. Um, another guiding principle for reader's advisory is to remain enthusiastic about your recommendations. Um, this is something that the more comfortable you get with working with patrons, the more you can really relax into your own tastes and your own likes and dislikes and your own enthusiasms. And I think that that really provides a genuine experience to readers and allows people to talk to you as just another friend, another reader, somebody who is interested in the same kind of books. And finally, this is the most important one. Um, and this is probably the most difficult of the guiding principles because it's important for all of us to read widely. And I definitely understand the time constraints associated with reading widely. Um, so obviously those of us who have really full lives with lots of activities or children or other jobs are going to look at this and think, OK, uh, I'll try. Um, but again, if you divorce yourself from the concept of what books are good or important, if you uh, let go of reading all the biggest books of the year or the prize winners, it becomes a lot easier to read widely. If you read a nice variety of young adult books, children's books, genre books, literary fiction, suddenly reading widely feels pretty comfortable. Um, but it is by far the best way to become an effective reader's advisor. So I have to encourage everyone to uh, read widely. So once you've kind of got those guiding principles in your mind, um, the main thing I wanted to talk about today is how to figure out what people want to read. I think this is a, dif a difficult piece for all of us when we do reader's advisory. Someone comes in and says, oh, you know, I'm, I'm really looking for a good book. I have no idea what I want to read. It could be a little overwhelming to just stare at a stranger and think, I have no idea what you want to read. Um, so we're going to talk about some strategies there in terms of piecing that information out and doing an interview to find out what it is that people are really interested in reading. One framework that I find particularly useful for doing that is um, something that Nancy Pearl developed. And Nancy says that we all read based on our preferred appeal characteristics. So appeal characteristics are those parts of a book that really suck you in, the pieces that you feel like, oh, I can't put this book down. It, it, it just speaks to me in a certain way as a reader. And she posits that there are four broad appeal characteristics. 
So those four appeal characteristics would be character, language, setting, and story. So I'll give everyone just a minute to go ahead and write those down because I think those are kind of the key pieces. So go ahead and write down those four and then we'll talk about them more in depth. I'm just gonna make sure there's no questions, but it looks like we're good. Okay, so in terms of the appeal characteristics, one important thing to keep in mind is that they don't apply universally to all literature. Um, and those of you who've ever had a kindergartner that only wanted to read books about cats maybe are gonna see this. Um, and those of you who maybe read widely in a genre are also gonna see this, that this framework doesn't perfectly fit every type of reading. But it does fit most of the fiction and nonfiction that a lot of us read. So you can apply it pretty broadly. Um, I recently was in my daughter's classroom and the second and third graders had read a book and they all made a poster to talk about the book. And by reading the posters, I could tell exactly what the appeal characteristics were for each child about that book. Some children talked all about the characters, some talked about the story, and some talked about the setting. It was so clear to me. And there was even one kid who loved language who talked about the funny jokes. Um, so I do think you can apply it pretty widely, but you might find instances where it's not a perfect fit. So that's just a caveat there. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about the appeal characteristics. The first one is character. And this is probably the appeal characteristic that most readers find really enticing. These are books where the characters are written in such a three-dimensional way. The descriptions always begin with the characters. Um, some of your favorite books might fall in this category. Anne Tyler writes really character-appealing books, John Irving. Um, I think Oprah is totally a character appeal characteristic reader. Almost any Oprah recommendation is going to be a book that is all about characters. Um, so some examples of character books would be a book like Olive Kittredge. And you can see here it has an endorsement from Oprah. So I guess maybe proving my point. I don't know. <laughs> um, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And a lot of people have read that book. And I think that that main character, Elizabeth, is so interesting. You know, at the end of the day, when you close the book before bed, that's who you're thinking about. What's her story? What's going on with her? A book like Twilight, obviously, is a character book. Anytime that there's a whole country choosing teams based on the character, Team Jacob, Team Edward, I'm going to go ahead and say that that's probably a largely character appeal going on in that book. Um, so it's kind of cool to think about it this way in terms of your uh, patrons, if you're talking to someone who loved Twilight and they just talk about the relationship between Edward and Bella, it's possible that they don't need another book about vampires. They're not really talking about it in that way. They might just need another book with a really strong character connection, a really strong doomed love story that has nothing to do with vampires, might be a better fit. Uh, the next appeal characteristic is setting. And this is one of those um, appeals where when you're reading the book, it's almost like the location is another character. I think we've all read books like that, where the setting comes so alive and you think this book couldn't be set anywhere else. These characters couldn't live anywhere else. This action has to be happening right here. Um, this is my personal favorite. So if anyone ever wants to recommend a book to me that you think has a great appealing setting, <laughs> I'd be happy to hear about it because it's my favorite. Um, some examples of books that have that setting appeal would be books that are set in unusual locales like Snowflower and the Secret Fan, where the fact that it's set in China is so very important to all of the action and how all of the characters respond to events in the story. Um, a book that's nonfiction, like Into Thin Air, would definitely fit in this setting category, where Mount Everest looms large as a character um, and a dangerous force in all of their lives. And Annie Prue's books, not only the Wyoming books, but her others, are so dependent on setting and location. And it, I think it's almost impossible for me to imagine her books taking place anywhere else. And of course, those of you who know her here in Wyoming know that she needs to live where her stories take place. That's how important setting is to her. Um, so as we're talking here, start thinking about which 
books you like that um, have these appeal characteristics. And you're welcome to even type them into the box and we'll take a look and see what, what suggestions everybody has. So you're welcome to type them into your webinar box and uh, Sarah and I can take a look at what your suggestions are for what books have great character appeal, what books have great setting appeal. The third of the appeal characteristics is language. These are books that typically you'll hear described as being really well written. That seems to be the, the key piece. Those books that um, win awards, the National Book Awards, the Pulitzer Prize, um, those kind of books frequently rely heavily on language as the most appealing characteristic. Um, sometimes characters can get a little lost. Those of you who've read books by um, Don DeLillo, or others, uh, fam famous, famous authors like Thomas Pynchon, you might say, yeah, I get that. You know, the characters, you don't form that same bond to them that you do to Edward and Bella by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but you can become totally enchanted by the way the author uses language. Some recent examples of language, these are some that I think most of us have heard of because, again, they're kind of the big award winners. Um, this Jennifer Egan book, A Visit from the Goon Squad, is such a great example of a language book. It even has an entire chapter that's formatted as a PowerPoint presentation. Um, obviously, she's taking some risks and doing some new things with format, language, structure, the entire definition of a novel. And if that appeals to you, that chapter is going to blow your mind. If you are more of an Oprah reader and you want to know what's happening with the characters and think about their psychological intertwinings, Maybe that chapter is just going to annoy you. Um, so it's important to think about that as well. If someone really doesn't like a particular appeal characteristic, um, remember that when recommending books as well. The final characteristic is story. And this is really just plot, books that are plot driven, books where the events dominate the story. Um, I like to think of these, the easiest way, way for me to remember story appeal is to think about page turners. What books could I not put down? A lot of the, I've read all the books that I've shown you today. Um, most of them I was able to put down and come back to after a day or two or even a week. Um, but these story books, no matter how much they're not appealing in terms of language sometimes, these are not going to win the Pulitzer by any stretch. But these are the ones that just keep you turning the pages. Um, I think The Da Vinci Code is kind of a classic example of a storybook because the plot and the page turners and the cliffhangers are so intense you just kind of can't stop reading. Um, and I recently read The Hunger Games and that one really fell into that category for me too. Um, and I noticed when I described that book, I recommended it to a lot of people. When I describe it to people, I don't talk about Katniss and her character. And I don't talk too much about the setting. Mostly what I say is, oh my gosh, you've got to read this book. The, they're going to pick two children from each state that have to go fight to the death. I mean, that is really an exciting plot. You really need to know what happens after you hear that. Um, so th these books are frequently not as literary, I guess you might say. Um, but they're certainly really appealing. And a lot of our patrons like to read these. One thing to think about now that we've talked about the four different appeal characteristics is that the very best books will frequently appeal on more than one of these four levels. Um, so some people might find that the language in a book is just as important as the setting. I think that Salman Rushdie's books are a great example of that. The setting is amazing, and his books couldn't be taking place anywhere else. But the language is also really powerful and keeps your interest if that's one of the things that appeals to you as a reader. Um, another book that appeals on every single level would be something like Harry Potter, where you really want to know what happens. It's definitely a page turner. The characters are so well developed. At the end of the books, you feel like you know Ron and Hermione and Harry. The language is amazing when you start thinking about Bertie Bot beans and all of the made up terms that Rowling has created for us. And then of course the setting of Hogwarts and this whole alternate universe 
is mind blowing. So the very best books and the books that the most people love are frequently going to fire on multiple cylinders. You're going to have appeal characteristics coming out like crazy. Um, and I'm sure we can all think of more examples of that. Um, the important thing to think about is just when you're talking to a patron and when you're reading books and thinking about them in these terms, oops, sorry, I'm getting calendar reminders. Uh, when you're thinking about books in these terms, you will be able to um, tease out what is appealing about the book and what appeal characteristics you can talk to patrons about and really think about in a helpful way. Um, so that said, and this is going to piggyback right on reading widely, I would encourage everyone, and this might come about naturally as you do the homework for this whole series of Reader's Advisory, I would really encourage you to write down every book you read and make a note about what's appealing about it. If it's a character book, make a note about the character's names so that if you look back at your notes, it'll jog your memory and you'll think, oh yeah, I remember them. I remember exactly what they were up to. And you can talk to a patron about it later. If it's a language book, make a note about what was really special about the language and what really appealed to you. Um, it sounds like a lot of work, but I have definitely learned over time um, with using this framework for Reader's Advisory, it's important for me to have a method in place where I keep track of what I read, and important for me to have a method in place where I keep track of what was interesting or cool or someone else might appreciate about that book. In some ways, too, this can feel really valuable. If you read a book that you didn't love, then you can kind of put yourself in someone else's shoes and think, well, what might someone else love about this? You know, what might be appealing about this book to a different kind of reader? So you might be able to glean a little value out of a book that you didn't necessarily enjoy um, in that regard as well. I'm just going to take a quick look and see if there's any questions about the appeal characteristics or if there's anything, um, any trouble going on with the slideshow here. It looks like we're in pretty good shape. I don't see anything. Okay. I like to check in every once in a while, make sure we're all right. So like I said, as we're going through, let's think about um, appeal characteristics. Oops. And books you've read, books you'd like to talk to patrons about. Um, so we've talked about keeping track of your appeal characteristics. Now we need to match those with your patrons. And that's sort of another step in the process. So you've been at home reading widely, taking notes, thinking carefully about appeal characteristics, interviewing everybody you know about what they've read and what was interesting about it. Um, and now you need to match that to your library patrons and really start thinking about what people in your branch, in your library, are actively reading and interested in. So of course there's going to be an interview, just like our reference interactions. We need to have a reader's advisory interview. And these are some suggestions that I've learned over time with really amazing reader's advisors as ways to start that conversation without locking out options. You want to keep it a really open-ended conversation, one where you're really listening and listening for cues about those appeal characteristics without kind of locking someone into saying that they really liked a book that maybe wasn't as exciting to them as it could have been. The first question that I always recommend starting with is, what was the last book you read that you liked? And I've heard a ton of readers' advisories start their interview with, what was the last book you read? And we can all probably think of some problems with that approach. One of the main problems is that if you're talking to a young person in particular, anyone who's still a student might not have liked the last book they read. It's entirely possible that you could talk to a 13-year-old and say, what was the last book you read? And they'd say, The Red Badge of Courage. And you'd think, oh, OK, you know, let's find some similar books when they hated The Red Badge of Courage and they read it for credit. So <laughs> it's important to kind of bear that in mind and uh, Ask it in a way that, what was the last book you read that you really liked, that really talked to you? Um, and that's going to give you a good idea of where the person's at. Once they've told you the name of the book they liked, then follow up. Tell me about that book. And that's really where you want to keep it open-ended. When you say, tell me about that book, 
you want to be listening for appeal cues. If they say, oh, it was set in ancient Tibet and there was a lot of action and you, and I just loved um, all the ways that they went to the ancient sites in Tibet and all the mystery clues that they had to solve. Then you're gonna, you might think to yourself, okay, this is a person who is very interested in setting and someone who's very interested in story, particularly in mystery plots. Like that's coming through loud and clear. That was a conversation I actually had with one of our patrons here from the University of Wyoming who graduated five years ago and I ran into her in a restaurant and I said, tell me about the last book you liked and that's what she told me. She told me exactly those things. And because I love setting so much, I ran right out and bought it. I thought that sounded pretty exciting to read a book about Tibet. Um, so uh, I guess her interview worked well with me. Uh, she recommended a book to me in that case. And that's another important thing to keep in mind, that this is a two-way street. So if you're going to presume to recommend books to your readers, let them recommend books to you and really listen and keep an ear out for what appeals to you. In this case, I thought, yeah, Tibet, I'll read that. Um, sometimes I don't follow up, I'll be honest, but it, it's important to keep it a two-way street and listen on both sides for what's really, really appealing. One important thing to keep in mind during this interview, so you're going to say, what was the last book that you liked? Tell me a little bit about it. Avoid things like, um, or sorry, what did you like about it? That's another way to talk about it. You want to avoid things like, what's the book about? If you say, what was that book about? The person is going to tell you the story, whether or not that was the most appealing thing to them. So the way you word your reference interview, your reader's advisory interview, is really important in this case. Um, by locking a patron into telling you what the book is about, you're going to miss out on some of those um, appeal characteristics. So keeping it really broad, what did you like about it? Tell me about it. Um, have you read other books by that author? Are they kind of similar? You know, do, do they hold the same appeal for you or was this a special one? Was this one a little bit different? Um, rather than just asking about what the book is about. Um, people will automatically default into kind of a book reporting mentality if you ask what a book is about. So I, I like to avoid that and, and keep a nice open-ended conversation. Once you've talked about the last book they read, you can start going through your mental list or your physical list that you've kept all your notes about which books you've read that have that appeal characteristic. And I think that this is a place where we get a little nervous thinking, oh, they I haven't read that much. Everybody's probably read the same books I have. I don't, I don't necessarily think that's true for most of us. I think most of us read an individual enough slate of books and if we're remembering to read widely and keep an open mind about what a good book is, we should all have a nice set of books that we can recommend at any time. Um, and it's, I'm constantly amazed, personally, when doing Reader's Advisory, at how many books that I loved that other people haven't read. And I'm always excited to put them in people's hands. Um, so I think that most of us will have a core set of books like that that we can really get into people's hands. There's a lot of books that librarians have been responsible for making bestsellers. And this is exactly how that happens. Books that were kind of off the radar that librarians read and loved and put in the hands of our patrons. Um, and then they put in a friend's hand and the process kept repeating. I think we can all think of probably 10 examples each of when that has happened. Um, you don't have to read all the new stuff. Remember that your patrons often aren't worried about whether it's brand new or the New York Times is talking about it. It's probably fine to pick something that you love that was published 15, 20 years ago. A lot of times those backlist books hold a lot of appeal and people just aren't thinking about them as much. Um, I know personally I have books on my to read list that have been there since 1995. I wouldn't mind at all if someone reminded me of one of those and said, hey, it's really good and put it in my hand. Um, so so don't, I guess I'm just encouraging everyone to be open-minded and not get hung up on those kinds of barriers because I don't think that our patrons are. They just want something to read on vacation or they want something to read while they're waiting for their kid in the orthodontist office and they want it to have the appeal characteristics that they like. That's pretty much it. Most of the other stuff kind of goes up.
Okay, so that's sort of the interview process. Um, and I'll just talk about a few final thoughts here, and then we'll have lots of time for questions, because I think there'll be some questions at the end. And I want to hear some of your ideas about um, what your appeal characteristics are and, and where you kind of classified yourself. I sort of like this exercise. It's a little bit like um, a boring day on the reference desk when you pull out the DSM-4 and start diagnosing everyone you know. It's kind of fun to uh, take a look at the four appeal characteristics and think about, oh, okay, so my mom really likes character, but I'm more setting, and my husband's more language-based, or, or however it shakes out. It's kind of fun to diagnose everybody. Um, so, so final thoughts. The most important thing to take away is in addition to reading widely, I think I've said two most important things to take away. Okay, so read widely, uh, but also practice. And that just involves starting conversations with patrons about what they like to read and opening that to a street to really getting to know your patrons. Um, and it just takes a little while to settle into it, but once you've got a great conversation going, it can last for years. So practicing is really important. And you can definitely practice on family members. I think that's a really great way to start this conversation until you kind of are used to thinking in terms of appeal characteristics and you're used to doing a reader's advisory in a specific interview. Um, it does take some time to develop relationships. And that's important to remember that people might not trust you right out of the gate. But once they do, they'll be back for more books. So, and it's okay to strike out too. I've noticed that the most avid readers have no problem saying, nope, this one didn't work. Do you have another one? So that's totally fine as well. I had a great um, young adult patron when I worked in Seattle who <laughs> would never trust me, even though I recommended lots of books that she ended up liking. Um, so her approach was to sit down in the library with any book I read, recommended, and read the first chapter before she committed to checking it out. <laughs> but I kind of liked her cautiousness. She was a great, um, a great measure of how good a book really was. And I've actually adapted her, her or adopted her approach myself. And I don't usually leave a library or a bookstore without having read the first chapter anymore. Um, so I was thankful for her example. But it did make me a little leery at first, because here I was, a new, new to readers' advisory, and um, she was just so sure that she might not like the book, but she didn't even want to check it out for free until she knew it was a good fit. Um, again, keep track of what you read and what you've read, what appeals. And remember, you know, the words of Ranganathan, that every book has its reader, and every reader has her book. Um, so even if a book doesn't appeal to you, it has a reader somewhere. Someone else will love it. Um, and there is a book out there for every one of your patrons. And it's not necessarily your job to find the perfect book for all of your patrons, but I think we should all be reading with an open mind and a mind to making connections between people we know are our patrons and books we know live in our collections. Um, I think that we come a lot closer to fulfilling Ranganathan's goals here if we can really connect with our collections and our patrons simultaneously and, and help people get books that are really going to appeal to them over the long term and create a relationship with the library that goes a little farther than information gathering and really gets down to what sorts of written word do we really connect with? What do we read as a democracy in our free time? How do we spend our days reading and learning and absorbing information about the world around us and about places we've never been or things we've never thought about. Um, so that's sort of the higher level thinking, I guess, behind Reader's Advisory. But I do think it's a really powerful and important force in our communities and something that especially our public libraries can do an amazing job with creating a community center and connecting readers with books that can change their lives. So with that said, I am happy to take questions. I would love to hear what everybody thinks or if this sounds like something like total hogwash or if it is something that is appealing to you and that you would like to practice in your own libraries.
Great. Thank you so much, Cass. Um, I'm going to go ahead and leave you unmuted as well. We do have a few questions that came in, and um, if over the next few minutes there's some other comments or questions, feel free to, um, to text those or, um, or just raise your hand if you have a comment on, on some of the questions. So um, first off, it looks like um, early on uh, May had, a, had her hand raised, but I think May that might have just been um, that might have just been you checking in, but I'll unmute you real quick if there were any comments that you had. I'm going to go ahead and assume no on that. I think she was just checking in at the beginning. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, read a question by Kathy, and I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Kathy, as well, if you want to expand on it. Uh, Kathy uh, wrote, how would you care, when uh, when Cass was talking about the, the different appeal characteristics, she um, she wrote, how would you characterize Prodigal Summer by Barbara Kingsolver? Strong setting and strong characters and story with different points of view. So lots of strong elements there. So um, uh, first I would go ahead, Kathy, what, what, would your, what would your gut be there? And maybe then a, a few other folks might have some comments as well. Did we lose Kathy? <laughs> Oop, did I unmute Kathy? I did. Is there anyone else with any thoughts who's read Prodigal Summer or Cass? Do you have any thoughts on that? I have not read it, but I think that it sounds like one of those examples of a book that's going to fall into multiple appeal characteristics. And of course, that's part of why Barbara Kingsolver has sold so many books. I would say that her primary characteristics of appeal would be character and setting. Those are always the things that when people recommend Barbara Kingsolver books to me. They really talk about where it took place and a lot about the characters. Um, I would say that's probably the major appeal characteristics of her book. Of her books in general would be the characters and how they interact with one another. Um, but there might be Barbara Kingsolver fans out there who would disagree with me. I mean, I don't think she necessarily falls into the page turner category as much as some. Uh, but yeah, she definitely appeals on multiple levels. Uh, yeah, certainly. I, I would agree with that. And um, let's see. Oh, and Kathy just, her mic wasn't plugged in. She said she agreed with Cass. And I would also say to that, too, that um, some, you know, when Cass was talking about the appeal characteristics, sometimes there is just a real strong, d d one of those definitely stands out. But sometimes there are strong elements of all of them. And then it comes back to what appeals to you. So maybe there's strong setting and strong character, but you're someone who loves character, but then that book's also going to appeal to somebody who likes setting. So that's that's a piece too. So uh, Kathy just checked in and, and said, Cass uh, said just what she was thinking as well. So, and another question that Kathy had was uh, to, to Cass specifically of just wondering where you keep track of your books um, and notes electronically with, with tags like, or, or in a handwritten log, just curious on that. That's a great question because I've just recently changed and I was talking to a lot of readers who I respected as I sort of have been changing. I have since library school, since learning from Nancy Pearl, kept a handwritten journal of every book I read and created an annotation for it um, that would describe the appeal characteristics and also remind me of what, what the book was about, what I read. Um, and that has worked really well for me for probably more years than I want to admit totally publicly. Uh, but I have experimented with some of the online tools that connect with Facebook, so Goodreads and some of those others. And those are nice. I like that um, the electronic options allow me to take that list with me. So I can access it at home or at work and have that sort of memory jog wherever I am. However, and this might sound a little bit Luddite, I have still maintained the written log just because some of those sites seem to come and go. One of the early sites that I used really stopped being the one that everybody else was using. Um, so it wasn't as useful for me to connect with friends. I think it's nice with the electronic tools too, that if your patrons or your friends are using those online tools and they're also using Facebook or whatever, you know, whatever social aspects of those tools are available, that you can then recommend books that way. 
and you can see what people are reading and you can ask them about it and then you can recommend books to one another. That's a really powerful um, functionality and I think it's a great way to work with readers. I know that Seattle Public Library now on their Facebook and I'm sure some of the other public libraries in Wyoming are doing this as well. Um, they do quite a bit of readers advisory on their Facebook account. So they'll say, you know, what's the best page turning you've read this year? What book couldn't you put down? That was one that they had recently on their Facebook. And they got hundreds of responses. And then they created um, a guide to those. So then they reposted on their Facebook, here's a list of the books our readers couldn't put down. And then they posted it on their website as a guide for this is what people loved reading in 2010 and 2011. Um, so yeah, those online tools, that kind of gets a little bit away from the original question, but I think the online tools have a lot of power um, for connecting readers. I don't know that they're doing such a great job of identifying those appeal characteristics. It's very easy on Goodreads for me to give a book four stars, really liked it, you know? <laughs> so I, I might not be as inclined to tease out those characteristics, um, but you, a lot of times people who write really thoughtful reviews and annotations on those sites are giving some good clues to what books are. Those sites also are nice if you use them. You can see what other readers that you trust read, and you can absorb that information without reading a lot of the books. So for example, the Barbara Kingsolver question. I haven't read Prodigal Summer, but I've read some Barbara Kingsolver books, and I have a pretty good idea of what the appeal characteristics are. But I could easily pop into Goodreads and see what friends I trusted read Prodigal Summer and kind of tease out whether it was a classic Barbara Kingsolver book or if there were differences and um, what those might be. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of useful tools out there for that kind of information. Great, thanks Cass. And I will also just um, make a note that um, next um, Tuesday's session will be uh, by uh, Tamara at Albany County. And she's gonna, her session is on indirect reader's advisory. She's gonna cover a lot of great tools, but I know she's gonna be discussing um, various social networking tools that can be used both for programming and merchandising um, within your library, as well as developing you know, your own personal reader's advisory skills. So we'll have a more in-depth conversation on that. Um, I just have a, a few more questions, and then we'll, we'll probably wrap it up here uh, soon. Um, Jennifer, um, I'm going to unmute you, because I want you to maybe ask your question to the group. It looks like you were asking what the were you asking what the difference is between in the interview of between tell me the book tell me about the book and what's the book about was that what you were asking <coughs> pardon me is that what you were asking uh, what the difference between those two questions here oh, okay and Jennifer does not have a mic so I'm gonna assume then Jennifer that your question was what's the difference between saying tell me about the book as opposed to what's that book about um, could you just maybe uh, clarify that for us, Cass? Sure. I think it does sound a little confusing at first. And this is one way um, where practice will give you some more information as well. So if you take two patrons and ask one, tell me about that book, and then ask another one, what ha what's that book about? Um, when you say tell me about that book, a person is more likely in that it's a little bit more open. So a person might say, oh, it's set in China, and I just thought the language was so beautiful, it really transported me there, and you know, the, the, each paragraph was like poetry. If you say, um, tell me about that book, or what's that book about, um, someone might be more likely to give you a plot synopsis. Like, well, it's about you know, China during the Han Dynasty, and then this happens, and then this happens. So um, just think for yourself. You don't have to use those exact examples, but just think for yourself how to ask the question in a way where the person is not prompted to give you the plot, or the person's not prompted to give you a book report, but rather they're prompted to tell you what they really loved about it, or what parts were the, you know, what were the best parts of the book for them, what they really, what really spoke to them about the book. Um, and that will often get you just a little bit more information, um, leaving it a little more wide open so that you don't, because usually you know what the plot is about. If I'm talking to a ninth grader who really enjoyed um, Twilight, I know what happens in Twilight, but I don't know necessarily why that ninth grader liked Twilight. Um, so I want to leave the question as open as possible to kind of hear what really spoke to her about that book. 
or him, I should say. <laughs> Great, thanks, Cass. And we have one um, one other comment I'll just read from May, and actually I'll sort of respond on it too, because um, I sort of feel I think the same way as May. She wrote, um, i trying to figure out how it all applies to the books that I've recently read. I can definitely see that I'm drawn into character, but I love settings as well. And um, and I think you, you mentioned that sort of briefly that when you first start it with the appeal characteristics that it doesn't always apply, but I also think the... The opposite is true um, in that the, if you know if you do read widely, as as Cass suggests, then then it, it can, and you have a variety of interests, then they multiple appeal characteristics can apply. And I definitely think I uh, I'm the same way. And I think um, both characters and settings are are my my two that I like, just as as um, as May has mentioned. So certainly um, it doesn't mean that you have to close yourself off. I think it's just a good way. Uh, to to think about when you're talking with your patrons and if you like more than one appeal characteristic even better even that'll help you I think even more in, in helping your patrons um, yeah, I totally yeah. agree with that I just wanted to add to that oh, too. Yeah. one way to kind of pinpoint appeal characteristics because I agree we most of us like a book that has all of those things going on um, but sometimes if you think about what appeal, what characteristic is it that will keep you reading a book that you otherwise wouldn't so, for example, I've read books that were an ama set in amazing locations and written horribly, and I kept reading because I just wanted to know more about the setting. So if you can think about maybe a bad example of, a, of something that appealed to you, sometimes that can help you sort of parcel it out, if, you know, think about it in a different way as well. Definitely a good point. I was actually thinking of some uh, movies um, when, I, when it, just in reference to what you were, were talking about, I was thinking of movies where, you know, maybe I didn't love the characters, but the story was good. So that a lot of what Cass talked about can, I think, translate to other media formats, too. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and... Uh, 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 show uh, Kathy's uh, last question here, and then I think we'll wrap it up. And this is just sort of an interesting, maybe a little bra brain teaser for the group. Um, she wrote, wrote, where would you classify reader involvement uh, books, like Choose Your Own Adventure or puzzle-type stories like Artemis Fowl or Blue Blue Ballet, um, and she also wrote Artemis Fowl. Um, there's elf. There's codes at the bottom of the pages, and then there's Facebook pages connected with stories like James Patterson's Angel Experiment. So some of these interactive interactive stories out there. I think that's a good little brain teaser to think on. I don't. I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> That's a great question. I'm interested to hear what people say in the blog comments later. I think that would be a great addition to the, the homework to find out what people think because I think there might be a couple of different arguments to be made there. Actually, that's, that's a really good point, Kathy. I think um, uh, you should uh, post that comment in the, uh, in the blog post and, and see what kind of responses come on that because there certainly will be um, uh, uh, more... Um, pardon me, uh, more people interacting on that than in our live presentation today. Um, and let's just, uh, I'll have Cass just wrap it up with one um, final, I know I said the last one was final, but now this one will be final because I think it'll be a good way to wrap it up. Um, Julie just posted one more question just to, uh, to clarify uh, if Cass could repeat the way to pinpoint the patron's appeal to a book. And if you want to just wrap up with that. Sure. You know, I think that, and it can be difficult to pinpoint, but listening, listening carefully for the cues when you do that interview is really going to give you a good idea of what appeals to your patrons. So if you say, what was the last book you read that you really liked? And then you say, what did you like about that book? The answers to those questions are going to help you sort of tease out the appeal characteristics. And you know, it's not a problem to say, oh, it sounds like the relationship between Edward and Bella was really something that meant a lot to you. Or it sounds like you were really intrigued by the language that they used. Um, and using that kind of reflective listening, like we do in a normal reference interview, can kind of help you pinpoint and, and get down to the bottom of what they're looking for. But a lot of it is practice. Um, for sure. Uh, the good news is that once you've built up a relationship with your patrons, you don't have to keep doing that because you know what kind of books and what appeal characteristics the individuals in your library have. Um, so once you've done the legwork, then you can 
match them with books all the time. If you say, hey, I just read Captain Corelli's Mandolin, and I loved the characters and the setting, and I know that's what you love, too. You should really try it on for size. Um, so once you've kind of built that relationship, it gets a lot easier. Great. But yeah, it does take practice in reading. <laughs> that's for sure. That's the hard work of it. That is, that is the hard work of it. Thank you so much, Cass. Um, I've gone back to the screen, get on the bus, wyoming.wordpress.com, and the page that uh, has some of the information from Cass's presentation today. This will also be where the video of, the, of Cass's presentation will be posted that you can review and let your coworkers know about. I think given the conversation that, that came from this, both from, from this session and the sessions to come, I I, I do think it would be a great idea to use the comments section of each page not only to um, review the homework questions that you've uh, gone over and worked on but also to post some of the questions that like the ones that came out of today like I said I think Kathy should uh, post that little head scratcher there about the choose your own adventure books and we can continue these conversations uh, par again participation will be keeping track of the names of the folks who participate and that will will work through um, what uh, what prizes will have available for folks based on how many folks do participate and just one last comment on uh, posting to the, the blogs, and I'll put this in an email when I send it out to everyone. If you've commented and participated in the past in the uh, reference Get on the Bus and some of the other ones we've done, then you'll be fine. You can post and um, you'll be good to go. If you haven't ever participated or if you have a new email that you enter in when you post a, a, a comment, there'll be a little bit of a delay. I have to approve it, to, you know, you know, verify that you're not spam, that sort of thing. So, um, so you won't see it automatically if you have never posted to this site before. But I'll, I'll get, I'll be monitoring it throughout the series. Um, I'd like to thank Cass very much. And the next session will be at 10 a.m. on um, this Thursday, and that will be Reader's Advisory on the Fly. And I will be presenting that one, so you'll get to listen to me uh, drone on for another hour. And we'll be discussing some tools and ways to do a uh, quick Reader's Advisory when your patrons rest or there's other other things that happen, sort of the ready reference version of Reader's Advisory. Thank you all very much for participating. If there are any other questions that I didn't see or didn't get to, again, feel free to email me directly, or uh, if it's a, just a question to the group, go ahead and, and post it on the, the WordPress site. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day.